Fine. Yeah. yeah. We can do that. Just at the green light signs operation. Yeah. These are the ones we have at the I call this caucus to order. Councilman McGoff, McGoff asked that I run this caucus tonight. Um, I was approached by um, our panelists here to have an information session regarding Senate Bill 76 um, quite some time ago. And for the regular viewers out there, you know it's something I talk about weekly at city council meetings. Um, because it really will benefit the taxpayers in the city of Scranton. Um, I would like to introduce our panel. Um, first in the middle, we have Chuck Ledecky from uh, Real Reform 76, Kim Skimanek, president of the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors, and Wayne Evans and Conrad Bosley from the Scranton Board of Realtors. And now I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Councilman. Uh, as the Councilman mentioned, my name is Chuck Ledeck. I am the uh, campaign manager for Real Reform 76. Real Reform 76 is a grassroots initiative uh, created for the uh, education and advocacy for uh, Senate Bill 76. The Pennsylvania Association of Realtors has been um, studying property tax reform for a number of years, and we created a more or less a task force, a steering committee, to study the issue uh, further about three years ago. And uh, with this steering committee, we brought in a number of legislators that had different uh, forms of property tax reform proposals. Uh, we sat them down, we asked them specifically why they, we thought, or they thought that their uh, legislation was the most appropriate. We sat down with Senator Argall um, and Senator Fulmer's staff, and that also included um, Senators uh, Judy Schwank and Senators John uh, Udichak. Um, so you had two Republicans and two Democrats uh, coming to the table and really wanting to hear why they, we thought, or they thought their, uh, their, per, their particular bill was the most uh, appropriate bill. At that time, the, uh, the bill was called House Bill 1776. We took a look at the bill. We actually had an economic firm out of Chicago study the bill further and um, uh, more or less tell us if the numbers were to work. Would schools have an opportunity to see that funding brought back into the schools? And we learned via 1776 that the numbers simply did not work. Uh, we testified before the Senate and before the House uh, in Pennsylvania about 1776 and informed them about the numbers not working. And they actually went back to the drawing table and changed the numbers and created Senate Bill and House Bill 76. Uh, in short, uh, what Senate Bill and House Bill 76 would do, and keep in mind these are identical pieces of legislation, just one is obviously in the House and one is in the Senate. Uh, what, the, what the intention of the legislation is uh, would be to eliminate the school portion of the property taxes here in Pennsylvania. Now this would eliminate property taxes not only on your primary residence, but on every property here in Pennsylvania. That includes your commercial properties, your mixed-use properties, vacation properties, um, uh, second home properties, what have you. Any property here in Pennsylvania, if Senate Bill 76 were to pass, would see an elimination in the property tax levied by schools. Now in turn, to ensure that schools get uh, funding, um, what would happen is you would see an increase in the personal income tax from 3.07 to 4.34, that's 1.27%. And then uh, the sales tax portion, 6% um, would go to 7%. Uh, we feel that the PIT and the sales tax are more equitable when it comes down to it because it allows individuals that earn and consume the most to put back into the system. And further, it also encourages um, the tax, overall tax burden not to be levied on one individual class of Pennsylvanians, and that's property owners. All individual Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania residents, and even people that are not uh, Pennsylvania residents, will be putting into the system. Um, part of our grassroots strategy really commenced in uh, October, November of uh, 2013, and what we've been doing is primarily education. Right now, we're at a, uh, at a better place than we've ever been. We have 25 co-sponsors in the Senate. Um, there's 50 state senators here in Pennsylvania, um, and you've got 203 representatives in the State House. Really what it comes down to is it's a numbers game, and the State Senate is simply uh, the smaller chamber where we're able to work with, with on, a, and on a more efficient level. 
We've been very fortunate because you're hearing a lot of Pennsylvanians across the state, even though they're burdens, they have different types of stories that they can share, and I'm sure Kim and Wayne will be sharing specific stories in a, in a moment. Um, it's impacting, unfortunately, so many Pennsylvanians across the state. So you're seeing this, uh, this higher amount of state senators that are, are indicating that this is something that they need to take a look at further and determine whether or not they want to support it. So as I mentioned, we've got 25 co-sponsors for Senate Bill 76. 13 of them are Republicans and 12 of them are Democrats. So you can see that this is a truly bipartisan bill. This is something that uh, we're able to, whenever we're educating people across Pennsylvania, let them know. It doesn't matter if you're right side of the aisle or your left side of the aisle, uh, you can come together and recognize that this is a burden that's been impacting residents for far too long. And I know just from my conversations up in this area, I've been in Scranton um, doing grassroots uh, advocacy and grassroots education for uh, the past few months again since October and November of 2013. And uh, I continue to hear the same thing here in Scranton and the overall region in Lackawanna County just indicating to me that uh, it is an issue up here. And I'm sure you've already been sharing that, uh, Councilman. So um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I do want to allow Kim and Wayne to have an opportunity to speak and certainly look forward to your questions um, if you do have any. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to um, speak to you this evening about this issue that we've been supportive of now. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to add to what, what Chuck said about this legislation is that we believe it's going to maintain, help to maintain an environment that's going to be conducive to home ownership as well as we feel that Pennsylvania is going to be a more attractive state for business and economic development. And we all know that when we have business and we have the, uh, the jobs that are here, then we have homeowners and we have people that are going to come uh, into the city, come and use the services that are here and available uh, in the city of Scranton. As uh, Chuck mentioned too the bipartisan support. We do have some legislators from the Northeast region that are already on board and supporting uh, this legislation. We still have a few more uh, that we've that we've met with that we hope to um, encourage to support this legislation this year. One of the things that I, I wanted just to share with you, we actually created a website last fall, realreform76.com. Since its debut in October, we've actually had over 24,000 unique visits to this website, mostly Pennsylvania homeowners, because a number of them have actually shared their stories about how excessive property, school property taxes have impacted them. Uh, we've heard, actually, we have almost uh, 400 stories that have been shared of uh, seniors, especially on fixed incomes, that have actually um, had to sell their home. They, they could no longer afford to pay the property taxes. They may have already paid the home off, but being on a fixed income, just the, as the property taxes have increased and increased, they were no longer able to do that. The challenge also is for younger home buyers that are just entering the market for the first time, that they're not able, based on their their income to debt ratios to actually afford certain properties because the taxes have become so high. And that all factors into what their monthly mortgage payment uh, would be. We've actually had over 4,000 messages that have been sent to our legislators uh, from uh, Pennsylvania, from the website, um, over 2,200 that were sent to senators who still have not yet signed on in support of this legislation, uh, 2,100 to senators that have already supported the bill to thank them uh, for their support. And I wanted to share um, some stories. As the president this year of the Pennsylvania Association, even though I'm from the Northeast, uh, I, I practice here in Lackawanna County and surrounding areas, um, I've had the opportunity to travel. And I've heard these same stories from realtors from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, from State College to York, about the problems that they're seeing with um, homeowners that are losing their properties because of the excessive property tax and also uh, buyers who are unable to afford to purchase the property for those reasons. Now I'd let Wayne share some information too from a local perspective. 
The risk of going last is you don't want to repeat what everybody else said before you, so I'll try not to. Um, I have a little bit different perspective on it as well. Uh, serving on the City Planning Commission for 10 years and being a community and neighborhood activist in Scranton, I know firsthand the value of home ownership in the city. We know that when you see a block that's predominantly homeowners, it's a good block. And that's how you change it. Home ownership does matter in the, in the city, and it's very, very important that we try to raise those levels of home ownership to stabilize our economy and stabilize our neighborhood. We've, as Kim said, we've, we're, we're seeing seniors that are making a choice of staying in their home that they've lived in all their lives or paying their taxes or moving. We've seen young families that aren't able to enter into the market because of the property tax liability. It's just too high, too difficult for them. I think also SB 76 allows Scranton to level the playing field with our neighboring communities because if we can reduce that large portion that's the school property tax, we, we already know our local tax is going up and has gone up. So we have to balance that somehow. We can't keep on going down this path of high taxes and expect citizens to look at Scranton as a viable place to work and live. But the economic engine of SB 76 is tremendous. Uh, you know, there's some studies that say that the uh, commercial real estate market will flourish when that is removed from the equation. And we certainly have opportunities for commercial development in our city. We, this week alone, we saw Diversified. We saw the VacuServe. This morning, we saw the mall. Uh, these are opportunities that if that portion of the tax bill has been removed or reduced, will be tremendous because we have the infrastructure in Scranton to allow for that, that growth. We're just not able to successfully do more. And I think we all, luckily, you know, I, I feel this administration, this council is all on the same page. And I think it's been an eye-opening uh, first few months to see how you've been working well together. So I think there's going to be a lot of value to that. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, we need SB 76. It took 30 years to get here. And I don't think we have... If this opportunity is lost, we can't wait another 30 years for the next opportunity. So thank you, gentlemen. Mary, you want to? I'd open up the questions. Yep. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, and then we'll, we'll go down the line. Um, Councilman McGough, since you're president of the board, would you like to go first? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, am I? Uh, correct in assuming that corporations and other business entities would also be excluded from the real estate tax under this bill? Yeah, what would happen is, um, first off, it's the school portion. So, um, uh, so a business owner, uh, say for example, whatever, a, a big business like Walmart or what have you, um, or even a small mom and pop pizza shop, what have you, their school portion of their property tax would be completely eliminated as well as individuals that own a primary residence. And it's, it's all property owners here in Pennsylvania. And how will the tax burden be assumed as a result of the loss of revenue from real estate taxes? So as I mentioned in the, uh, in the beginning, um, we did some economic analysis of the previous version of this bill as well as uh, Senate Bill 76 in its current form. Uh, Anderson Economic Group is the, uh, the firm that we hired uh, from Chicago to study this bill. Um, and additionally, the Independent Fiscal Office, which is a nonpartisan uh, budgetary office with the Pennsylvania, uh, with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, also studied this, this bill as well and both cooperated um, it, it the same results. What happens is the revenues that are raised via the PIT and the sales tax, as I mentioned, from 307 to 434 and from 6 to 7 percent, the revenues that are collected via those new taxes will go into something called the Education Stabilization Fund. Senate Bill 76, much differently than other uh, pieces of legislation, creates this new line item fund in the budget which again is called the Education Stabilization Fund. And what happens is, if Senate Bill 76 were to pass today, for example, next year, the uh, revenues that are collected via the PIT and the sales that go into the Education Stabilization Fund, they will then go right back to the schools for a dollar for dollar 
match. Now, uh, additionally, we know via both, both of these economic analysis that they will continue to see increases year after year around the rate of inflation. Uh, but that's more or less how this plan is significantly different than other previous plans is because it primarily puts that, puts that uh, line item in place. If you want to touch that as well. My, oh. I was going to ask kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, in that study, did they calculate what 1% um, would mean to the average consumer in terms of dollars? The sales tax. Uh, it, well, everybody's spending habits are, are different, um, and we can share some of our uh, economic analysis with you so you can take a look at it. It's also available on the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors website, parealtor.org. Um, what we did was we had, uh, I shouldn't say we, another group took a look at how much would have to be spent in sales taxable items to equal just $1,000 um, in property tax elimination, just $1,000 being eliminated from your property tax bill, an individual, in order to match that tax uh, raised, would have to spend $14,000 in sales taxable items. Uh, that source is uh, with the Pennsylvania Taxpayer Cyber Coalition. Um, and you're not seeing too many people spending $14,000 worth of sales taxable items uh, when it comes down to it, but even when they are, um, the, their property tax burden might be more than that. So if you, you could double it, triple it, and what have you. Any other follow-up questions? On, on that note, yeah. it should be noted that the, uh, there was some concern that because the sales tax would go up to 7% that we would lose business to bordering states. But all of the bordering states of Pennsylvania are actually higher than Pennsylvania as far as the sales tax is concerned. So we're still at or below those levels. In fact, there's some counties in New York, I think, that are 9.4, 9.5, because they are, they're allowed to do them, you know, almost randomly, I guess. I, I guess, I, I'm just, from my own perspective, I would end up paying more in 1% sales tax than I would in property taxes over the course of a year. Um, maybe and I kind of sure. mid-range... Well, the key is though, so, and that, that would be my concern that you know we're just shifting the burden, um, and, and maybe the burden would be greater. Uh, you're right in the sense that we are shi uh, shifting the burden, but now we're shifting to the burden to all individuals here in Pennsylvania rather than just property owners. I'm going to tell you right now, just when I'm crossing the state talking to different individuals, um, <clears throat> right now, right now, people are losing their homes. Right now, people are unable to afford to purchase a home. So it really comes down to a question of fairness. Is it more fair for individuals to pay a property tax where if they've been in their home for a number of years, like an older uh, senior or an individual uh, young family that wants to move in their homes, or is it fairer for an individual that is consuming more and earning more to put back into the system? And again, like I said, it opens it up to all individuals putting back into the system. And I would say that that is the plus to the bill, the, the, the balance is that it does go to non-property owners as well. Correct. And that's all I had. Thank you. Correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I, I just have two questions. Um, the, the first one actually is relating to Scranton specifically, and I think some of my colleagues and the members of the audience will remember this. Um, in, in the city of Scranton, we, we, we have many budgetary problems, and one of the key ones that the Pennsylvania Economy League noted was that because in our county there hasn't been a reassessment of taxes in over 20 years. Because of that, tax revenues to the city have been stagnant, with, and also to the school district. Mm -hmm. um, with switching to a sales and income um, tax to fund our school districts as wages increase and as spending increases, would it be safe to say that the amount of tax going to the school district would increase just like it does with the city wage tax? So what happens is, under the Education Stabilization <coughs> Fund, uh, what happens is, year after year, schools will see increases, but again, it's around the rate of inflation. And the rate of inflation does, uh, it, it changes, it's not drastic, but it does change slightly. So when, it, when you see uh, uh, levels infl of inflation that are, are, are better, so better years, the school districts would then see more dollars coming back into their, uh, into their school districts. Right. What's, what's specifically hurting? the taxing bodies in Lackawanna County is the lack of reassessment in, in, in so long. Sure. And, and because of that, we haven't seen, as property values grow, we haven't been, government hasn't been realizing those gains um, sure. where 
on our wage tax, we have been. Um, my other question is, um, some who are against Senate Bill 76 will say, well, you're also helping corporations, which is true. But, for instance, in, in the city of Scranton, just in the last two days, um, multiple businesses have left the city. Um, the mall is on the brink of foreclosure. And certainly property taxes in the city of Scranton are much higher than they are in our neighbors in, for instance, Music, where two of these businesses are locating. Um, how do you see, do you see a more level playing field for cities like Scranton as a result of a bill like this? Uh, I don't see why not. As, as you mentioned, Councilman, uh, Pennsylvania as a whole, Pennsylvania as a whole is not necessarily a business friendly state, but we do believe that uh, if, if you would see Senate Bill 76 pass, it would create more of an incentive not only for big business, but also for small businesses to start operating here in Pennsylvania. I can defer to Kim and to Wayne about specifically Scranton, but when it comes down to it, you would see some sort of economic resurgence. You're seeing right now, I'm going to use Maniunk as an example in Philadelphia. Maniunk sees that urban revitalization because more and more people want to live uh, closer work to where they work. They want to be able to live to where that they, they can uh, go to movies, they can go to shows, what have you. And Scranton, you have here in this city many opportunities for young professionals, um, uh, exponentially for, for young professionals, but also individuals that uh, might not consider themselves young professionals anymore. And uh, I, I do believe Scranton has that opportunity for individuals. Do you guys want to? I've actually seen um, individuals that want to specifically be within the city of Scranton. Uh, they want to be able to take advantage of the public transportation that's available, be able to walk uh, downtown uh, to take advantage of, of many of the restaurants and, and other venues that, that are here for them to enjoy. Um, and a lot of those folks are, are the ones that are, are coming here with the medical college uh, as well as others. But I would hope that it would create some opportunity for businesses to relocate. And when you think about it also, the current business owners in the city that own their buildings, where their businesses are located, by having you know that burden of the property tax from this on the school portion lifted from them imagine what else they might be able to do maybe use that money to improve the facade of the building or to to add uh, additional services uh, for customers absolutely and, and one final point before we move on I, I just would like to say two of the biggest problems that i see in the city and i think we all see it as younger people uh, my age and councilman gohan's age when they graduate college or are leaving town. I see a bunch of young faces up there. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> and, and a lot of our senior citizens are, are selling their homes and, sure. and they're being sold and, and as uh, Wayne Evans mentioned, they're oftentimes being converted into rental properties. And as, as was mentioned, you could really see the difference on a block that has a block of single family homes with Scrantonians living in it, taking pride in their property versus a block that is, you know, all, all rentals, or you may have many house, five, six houses for sale. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to drive down one street in the city to see three, four houses for sale. And obviously home ownership is the American dream. And that's why I think many, many support this bill. So thank you for coming in. Uh, Councilman Wexler, do you have any comments? Yes, or I do. questions? A couple questions. Um, does this bill permanently eliminate the property tax? So what happens is uh, Senate Bill 76, yes, just to answer your question in short, yes, the school portion of the property yes. tax. Um, but um, uh, that does not include county as well as um, municipal. But to answer your question in short, then yes. Okay. Um, the sales tax, um, are the taxable items, are they expanded? Could I, could I just go back to your first question? I, I do want to make a, a, a point, though, that if a school district finds that they want to raise additional revenue for a project, let's say um, they, they want to build a new uh, uh, a gym um, and put in a new pool, uh, something like that, or they have some big project that they want to undertake, but based on the revenue that they're receiving, aren't able to, to do that, they can actually put that um, project uh, and a tax attached to it uh, to referendum. And then it would be up to the voters to decide 
whether they would be willing to accept an additional tax, property tax, just, uh, uh, just, uh, just additional tax for that specific project. So that is something that they do have that opportunity to do should they want to. Thank, thank you, Kim, and I apologize for not bringing that up, but um, they would not, property tax would be completely eliminated for the schools. They would actually, everything that Kim said, they it would be put to a voter referendum, but I'll, I'll use another example, local income tax. The school district can put that on the ballot. Um, uh, they can put that to referendum, but they actually would not even be able, even via a ro voter referendum, would not be able to put the property tax um, up for a, uh, a vote. Okay, and, and those, uh, those type of projects would have a set amount of time for the tax. It wouldn't be like the Johnstown's tax that, <laughs> that never went away. That's correct. Right. That's correct. And then once it's eliminated, they have to, you know, okay. start over again. Uh, and back to the sales tax, are the taxable items going to be expanded? That's correct. So let me touch that for uh, a, a few brief moments. Um, so the sales tax would, like I said, increase from 6 to 7%. Now, um, foods of necessity. Um, WIC, it's, it's really the WIC list, the women, infilled, women, infant, and children list. So that's more or less your eggs, your milk, your water, um, bread, what have you. That would remain not taxed. It's currently not taxed, and it would remain not taxed. Um, but your other items, uh, foods that are not considered foods of necessity, um, that would then be taxed. Um, additionally, uh, clothing um, under $50 would remain not taxed. Again, these are items, most, most things of clothing, most articles of clothing you can purchase, uh, but if you're looking at your name brand jeans or, or what have you, um, you would see uh, 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 the increase uh, on that. But again, that's $50 or more. So you're gonna see a lot of those 49.95 sales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm probably, this is, a, is an unfair question to ask, but is there anything in the bill to encourage uh, cost cutting or savings? Um, I'm a little nervous that with new tax revenues that we may see an expansion of spending. You want to talk? Okay. I think it, it would encourage cost cutting because now you have a body, a school board, that knows that every year they just can't automatically increase the sales tax and put the burden of funding the programs on the backs of property owners. So I do believe it's going to encourage those elected officials on school boards to take a closer look and find ways uh, to be um, more frugal in, in their spending. Thank you. That's Councilman Gohan, any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, I want to touch on one thing that uh, Councilman Wester mentioned before about the assessment. I think Councilman Rogan did as well. The last reassessment in Lackawanna County was done in 1970. Scranton was a very different city in 1970. The values were much higher in 1970. So therefore, the taxes are that much higher. That's why if this was passed, there is such a great opportunity for tremendous growth on the commercial side and getting businesses back in the city because that's a big chunk and a big reason why a lot of these buildings aren't being developed properly or at all. Uh, ultimately, you know, this is obviously only the school portion, but if we were so far reaching that we decided to do local tax and county tax, there would be no need for reassessment or assessments at all because there wouldn't be anything to assess. That's, and that's the long time. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going there yet, but that's uh, in a perfect world. Well, thank you everyone yeah. for coming in. Um, and if, if um, those in the public want more information regarding Senate Bill 76, um, who should they contact? Uh, RealReform76.com. Again, that's RealReform76.com. As Kim had mentioned, is our website. Um, there is a share your story section. And um, we actually, uh, obviously, the stories get sent to us. So if anybody has a question, they could actually put it up on that website and share it with us. And I could follow up as long as they have an email or a, a phone number attached to it. They can do that. Uh, I'd also encourage them uh, to contact you. Uh, you and I have been in communication. I'll leave my business cards with my contact information with each of you so that if anybody does reach out to you, they have a, a very quick and easy way to send me a, a, an email or give me a phone call. Great. And for, for those who support the bill, um, what would you encourage them to do? Well, individuals that support the bill, uh, first and foremost, I encourage them, again, visit the website, contact your uh, state senator. If your state senator does support 
the bill, then I encourage you to thank your state senator. Uh, and then additionally, if your state senator uh, does not yet support the bill, I do encourage uh, him or her to reach out and let them know exactly how uh, school property taxes have impacted them. It's really important to share their story so that, that uh, their state senator has an opportunity to hear that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please stay standing for a moment of silent reflection for servicemen and women throughout the world and also for those who have passed away in our community, particularly Kevin Joyce, a former member of the Scranton Fire Department, Joe Cardamone, a city employee, and also Sam Rosen, a, a truly a, a loss to the Scranton community. Roll call, please. Mr. Wexler? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loskin? Mr. Gaughan? Here. Mr. McGough? Here. I'd like the minutes to reflect that uh, Councilman Loskin was in the office earlier and that there was a family situation and that he may not be at tonight's meeting. Uh, dispense with the reading of the minutes. Third order. 3A, minutes of the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority's regular board meeting of January 16th, 2014. Are there any comments? If not, receive them filed. 3B, minutes of the Scranton Police Pension Commission meeting held January 22nd, 2014. Are there any comments? If not, receive them filed. 3C, minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held January 22nd, 2014. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, minutes of the Firefighters Pension Commission meeting held January 22nd, 2014. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, tax assessor's report for the hearing held February 12, 2014. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Any clerk's notes? Mrs. Reed? Nothing at this time, Mr. McGough. Thank you. Any council members have announcements at this time? Yes, I have one. I just have to pull it up. I apologize. Okay. 
During Lent, the Dante Literary Society at 1918 Prospect Avenue um, will be having a clam chowder sale every Friday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. It's $7 for a quart of Manhattan clam chowder, and that runs every Friday throughout Lent. That's all. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I would like once again to remind people that there will be a public hearing on the grant proposal through DCED. That public hearing will be held on March 17th at 1.30 p.m. in council chambers. Um, that is, again, a public hearing dealing with the grant proposal um, through DCED. And that is all. Fourth order, citizens' participation. Uh, first speaker, Joan Hodewanitz. Good evening. Joan Hodewanitz, taxpayer. Uh, Mr. Rogan, I want to thank you for having that caucus on uh, Senate Bill 76. It was very informative. I wish we could have asked questions from the audience, but I realize that there are time constraints, and so I will email to you probably uh, a few questions that I do have. Um, it's been a very newsworthy week, and there are several articles in the Times Tribune uh, which I would like to ask some questions about. Mr. McGough, I did email you these questions very late this afternoon, so you probably have not seen them. Uh, but basically, um, concerning the Steamtown Mall, uh, I'd like to know how much money the City of Scranton loaned to the Steamtown Mall over the years. What is the likelihood that the City will recoup any loaned money if the mall goes into foreclosure? And exactly how much Scranton taxpayer money is at risk? Uh, also, with regard to the mall, has the mall paid property taxes since it opened? or was it granted an exemption? If it paid property taxes, how much has it paid since it opened? If it was granted an exemption, how much tax revenue has the city lost over the years? And the second issue that I found very compelling was um, an article that Mr. Henry Amoroso was going to brief city council. So I'd like to know if he has, in fact, brief city council on his preliminary findings on the city's budget and structural deficit. If not, when will he do so? Will this information be shared with the public? How and when, for example, will you schedule a public caucus? Or will you post this information on the city's website, if possible? Um, and because the city's in such dire financial straits, those two issues just seem to overwhelm everything, including VaxServe, um, general dynamics, and all the other bad news that's been flowing out of the city. Uh, I realize that you haven't had a chance really to see that email, but if you would like to comment sometime tonight on the general issue of the mall and the status of Mr. Amoroso's preliminary, preliminary feedback to you, I'd be most interested. And again, Mr. Rogan, thanks for doing such a good job. Thank you. I, I will quickly respond to the, the second part of the, the questions that you had. Um, council has not had anything specific from Mr. Amoroso. Um, when there is something specific that is conveyed to us, um, we will certainly um, make it public uh, at a meeting. Uh, Mr. Quinn. Thank you. Good evening, Ozzy Quinn. Uh, tonight I'm coming here wearing a different hat. I was just appointed the president of the uh, Neighborhood Hill Association. And uh, on Saturday, I read in the Scranton Times Tribune about 10 properties being demolished, and two of them were in the Hill section. And I'd like to ask 
Uh, I know the ship has left the dock. It's gone over to OECD for a bid. But in the future, would you please have a structural engineer look at the, any building you're going to tear down and instead of just leaving that uh, blighted lot? The Hill Neighborhood Association, the Hill section, hasn't received any monies without the, without the exception of demolition monies for at least 10 years, 10 years I know of, okay? And uh, I plan right now, I'm in the process of working with a sociology professor who's going to develop, design a socioeconomic survey and we're going to, going to do a sample uh, survey of the uh, Hill neighborhood. Uh, with the data that we recover, we're hopefully we're going to look at ways and means that we start to uh, uh, come in here to the city council and the mayor's office and try to get on board with some of the community development block grant program. Uh, that is in regards to uh, housing rehabilitation, uh, repairs, whatever, okay? Uh, so much has been spent. Mr. Doherty's house of cards is collapsing. He spent all that money downtown. You go around and look at the neighborhoods. Some of the neighborhood sections are still very good. There's no doubt about it. Some in the hill section, there's beautiful homes. But blight has touched most of the neighborhoods. He hasn't spent the money that's that should have been. He had once he came on board, he eliminated housing rehabilitation. He eliminated, with the exception of a few thousand dollars out to new works, neighbor works, who, when I asked them for an application, they says, yes, but it'll take a year for, us to, for your application to come up. Now, no comprehensive rehabilitation in the neighborhoods. So that's what I hope to do in the future. Okay, is that with this survey, I'm going to come in with the data and show just what we need. The, trans the transition in the hill section has been quite large, and that's why we have to do the socioeconomic study. And we're also going to do a business retention study. We're going to ask the businesses what problems are facing them in regards to zoning, parking, whatever, okay? and hope to retain the businesses. Maybe we can look at ways and means that we could sit down and start with the hill section as a facilitator with landlords to try to get, sell off some of these parcels of land that are unbuildable with one owner on one side and the other on the owner's side and try to do something in that manner to eliminate the blight because at least, if they're not paying taxes, at least they're uh, cutting the grass and shoveling the snow and whatnot, okay? You can't build on them, okay? But some of them, some of those lots are buildable and it's been years. I know, I know one lot, 20 years. I, 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 I know it's been on the books for 20 years, vacant, and it's a buildable lot. There has been nobody out there trying to put programs together outside the box to do anything. And this is what we're left with. We're left with the neighborhoods that we have to try to revitalize. There's no doubt about it. And we got to look at the city as a, in a positive way. A lot has happened in the last few days. Mr. Mayor Courtright has a lot on his plate. And uh, I just hope that he's able to get himself in a position where he can at least, you know, serve his four years as a mayor should be without trying to go back and try to fix the problems of the past, okay? And that's what he's doing. I imagine he probably does that for most of his day, repairing what has happened in the past. So I hope that you'll we start to look at things. I'm leaving now that you hope to look at things and consider us in the future for some kind of a community development block grant, okay? Thank you, bye. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Mr. Elman? Brother McGough, over all those years, it never occurred to me you'd be in that chair someday. Yes. Again? I certainly am happy I didn't <laughs> throw things at you and jump up and down and call you names publicly. In the words of our great two, philosopher, deja vu yeah. all over again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could only wish you two new guys luck, because you're needed. You know, there's... A few weeks ago, the paper said there was a 60% increase in foreclosures right here, not in Ohio and New York, here. So what do we do? Have a 57% increase in the house taxes. People are leaving here in droves, businesses. Nobody wants anything to do with it. It's because of the taxes. There's no all this nonsense and excuses. It's the taxes. Everything you do is taxed, and why? Why are, why are we taxing the hell out of everything in this city? It's, it's, it's one reason. The university, ARC, Keystone Resources, Lackawanna College, they have destroyed our tax base. That's why the taxes are just outrageous and people are leaving town. There's, no, there's nothing... No other reason that I've, I hear all kinds of nonsense from, in the paper from the administration. It's taxes, and you can ask people that are leaving. That's taxes for crying out loud. I don't know how many of you are aware of it. This week, Keystone Resources knocked off $4 million in one right here. One swoop, four million dollars of property here in the city and the county. They already have over 60 houses. Who's going to make that up? How are we going to make up? Mr. McGough, how are we going to make up four million dollars from them? I do not know. Yeah, there's got, it's got to stop. See, but you people are fearful of attacking these phony nonprofits, and now there's no stopping them. This is a good example. Right here, Mr. Fleece, that's president of, of Keystone Resources, he wrote a letter to his employees, and I'll bring it up there if you want to see it. Quickly. He states that all of us are aware of the economic and financial hardships, the difficulties, uncertainty of, of the times. So he knows how bad it is here. He says so. So what does he do about it? This is in this letter he wrote. First, he's paying 90% of his employees' insurance for them and their families. Next. He's given significant increases in salaries, and lastly, he's giving a cost of living expense to all his employees. This is for on us, the taxpayers. He's not paying taxes. If one of his houses burned down, we're paying for the fire truck to go over there. He could care less what goes on in this city. He sure got a good name, Fleece, because they are fleecing the hell out of the people of this city. Uh, I, I, this something got to be done. You just this you can't you, you, you there's no way you're not going to have a tax increase next year. All this counterproductive it, it, it's killing the city. The, the only thing you got to do is go over here to these nonprofits and put an end to this. I don't know how you do it, you know. I'm not, I'm not up there. I'd be up there if I was, or I'd be in Mr. Menorah's position if I had that much sense. <laughs> but <laughs> these institutions have just killed the city. You know, we're dead in the water, and nobody wants to realize it. 
I, 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 the first two months of Mr. Cartwright's administration been very disappointing to me, but you know, you can't judge nothing on two months, and he's a good man, and I like him, and I, I only wish him the best. Was anyone want to see this letter he wrote? Give it to Mrs. Carrera and we'll... Here, Mrs. somebody Carrera. needs to see this. $3.6 million of property in this city, gone. Thank you, Mr. Elman. Thank you for allowing me to speak, Mr. McGough. Mr. Spindler. Good evening, Council. Les Spindler, city resident, homeowner, taxpayer. Uh, Mr. McGough, I'm glad you mentioned Sam Rosen. I knew Sam Rosen for many, many years. He was a great man. Uh, many people might not know he was a Holocaust survivor. Lost his whole family in the Holocaust. His parents and many siblings. And uh, several years ago, Sam befriended a member of our family and became like an extended member of our family. We've had a family reunion for over 50 years. And for the last several years, Sam has attended our reunion. He was like family to us towards the end. And uh, he's going to be sorely missed. Yes, and uh, Sam went around educating people about the Holocaust. He spoke at schools, he spoke to different organizations, and uh, the nicest man you ever wanted to meet, and he will be missed. Rest in peace, Sam. Uh, Mr. McGough, last week there were people taking shots at you here for different reasons, about having caucus meetings in, in the clerk's office, and so oh, Mrs. Evans, she had transparency, she had meetings out here. Well, that's not totally true. You had a meeting out here tonight, what you tried to explain to these people was caucus of council you will have in the clerk's office. And Mrs. Evans had those same meetings. You might remember what I, what I remember one specifically. I forget what the subject was, but there were so many people you couldn't fit everybody in the office. Do you remember that? That, that should have been held out here. And these people coming with their Sunshine Act laws last week, they didn't do that when Mrs. Evans had the meeting in, in the clerk's office. So uh, they're not being fair to you. And uh, another thing, they're criticizing the mayor for hiring the uh, Abrahamson Law Firm. Well, they were the lowest bidder, according to the Times Tribune. If they hired somebody to, over with a higher bid, they'd be here complaining about that. You, you can't please these people. Mr. Spindler, I did request from the law department a list of all the bids and a breakdown and I'll be addressing um, all of those under motions as well. Okay. Yeah, the one speaker said it was cronyism. Well, no, it wasn't. It was the lowest bidder. Like I said, that same speaker would be here criticizing if they took a higher bidder. Like, you can't, like I said, you can't please these people. And uh, lastly, they're criticizing the mayor and the business administrator for getting raises. Well, they didn't give themselves raises. It was the previous council that gave them the raises. These people are criticizing the wrong people. I just want to make that clear for everybody out there. Uh, moving on. Uh, I'm glad to see the city's out patching a lot of the potholes. I know yesterday or the day before they were in Trip Park. So I lived there. I was glad to see that. And uh, I know it's tough, but the, the weather is going to start getting nicer now, so hopefully it'll really make some headway. Uh, Lastly, people are talking about the mall. It's being foreclosed upon. and That might not be bad news. The general manager was on Channel 16 tonight, and he said, uh, foreclosure isn't going to be bad news. It's going to be just like somebody refinancing your house. They're going to refinance their debt, and it, it could end up being a good thing for the mall. Hopefully, uh, they can get a, a good tenant in where the bond time used to be. And maybe that will lead other stores to come, but uh, I, for one, and I always supported the mall. I don't go to the shops. And maybe these people are criticized. There's nothing in the mall, nothing here. Maybe if you went and shopped there, there'd be more stores there instead of fleeing the city to shop somewhere else. And I love Boscos. I think it's a great store. And uh, I think people should, more people should support the mall. And maybe they wouldn't be in the shape they are now. Uh, that's all I have tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Spindler. 
Mr. Spiraglia? <coughs> Andy Spraglia, Citizens Grant and Fellows Grantonians. I watched your little caucus on House Bill 76 and Senate Bill 76. And if you listen closely to what was said, you would find out it was open ended. He said, as inflation goes up, so goes your taxes. The schools are going to get the same, but nobody says the schools have to live within a budget. They're going to get the same now or whatever the increase will be and so forth and so on. And they can tax again if they find a project they so desire and go before the board. But they didn't answer the question on the renters. What are the people who are renting getting from House Bill 76 besides higher taxes? That's all they're getting. You know that, and I know that. It may help the city, your grant maybe to get out of a position they're in, because without this bill passing, you're going to be raising taxes. There's no question about it. The first time they came here, this uh, team from the mayor, the new mayor, Courtright, said we were $7 million out of kilter with the budget. And I can see that budget has gotten out of kilter a lot more than the $7 million. So that leaves you one choice. Either try to get revenue from passing a house bill that hurts half the people in the city and the state to get you out of a jam you're going to be in. You're going to go to the election with a huge tax increase in people's memories. There always is. There's three taxes you sat by, Mr. McGough, and passed while you were on your seven years. Well, the, the newspaper keeps track of you. Now, what's happening with the rest of you? Well, the, the majority of you that have been here for a while passed the largest tax increase in the city's history. And there's no solution to your problems because you're not looking at solutions. I don't know if you can. But you can certainly go to the mayor and say, this is how it is. You're going to hire a, somebody to help with administration with labor contracts. You know and I know it's three years before they come up. So you have to iron out problems. And I don't know how you're going to do it. Wages is one thing. Pensions is one thing. But all that other stuff they're getting isn't necessary. I only get five pays holidays when I worked. They should be the same. The city employees should be acted just like they would in a business. You got to run the city like a business. When you get a promotion, you get a raise in pay. You don't get a raise in pay just because you live long enough in the job. That's not the way to do things. That's why the city is in trouble. And the previous mayor should have never passed that bill saying you can have medical as long as you live. We already knew what was going to happen with the medical. Why do you think this, our good legislator in the Congress in the United States said you can no longer write off the medical bills unless they're astronomical part of your income? They knew what was going to happen. Nothing happens by accident. This city isn't here by accident. This is done by people not doing what they were supposed to do to prevent it. If you just sit there and say you want to agree with the mayor, that's not the way to act. You're there to protect the people of Scranton. If you agree with the mayor, you agree with the mayor. But you're not there to say, I'm there to be his buddy buddy. That's not what you're elected for. You're elected to represent all the people of Scranton, not just the people who voted the mayor in or are friends of the mayor. You have been going down the trap for four years, I warned you. Now you didn't take my advice, you don't have to. But for somebody that all went to college, I don't know why you couldn't see what was happening if a stupid person like me could. <laughs> there is no way you could have done what you did without knowing what was going to happen. Now here we stand with no solution. Uh, the, uh, with, uh, the chamber come up with a solution. Just get away with the tax on the business privilege and mercantile tax. Put it in another tax. You got to have dollar amounts before you do anything. You just don't go for a pie in the sky 
If they say, get rid of the mercantile and business privilege and put in with a payroll tax, we'll double your payment to the city, then go for it. But it's not going to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spiraglia. Anyone else who cares to address council? Mr. Dobson. Good evening, Dave Dobson, resident. Taxes paid, I think, <laughs> at least on my first property. I have uh, some cutouts. Um, I'm going to relate that to the sewer authority. I was happy with the comments I read uh, of one council member, but it's merely to point out what these people do when they get privatized and re, uh, deregulated. And what it says is PUC for the television, uh, PUC shrugs that licenses to gouge. And on the side articles, there are letters from people who have had their electric rates raised as high as 300% under the guise of uh, Tom Ridge duct tape forever uh, when he was a uh, uh, security advisor to the president. Uh, he advised people to duct tape themselves in their houses in case those terrible terrorists came around. And, uh, you know, the whole thing was a scam. I knew that. It's from back in 98 or 99. And obviously, these people would probably have the right to sue the state. But what this does is dries up money out of people's pockets that uh, say, if last week I pointed out that my sewer rate would double under a privatized sewer system, I could pay that money in taxes or I can pay it in uh, to a sewer rate, but I can't pay it to both because I won't have that money if I'm paying it to one or the other. So it's just some food for thought. And uh, also, I have to get it in writing, I understand that, but we have power lines that run straight through NAOG. It wasn't an issue years ago because it was illegal to go over to that side. You had a trespass on railroad property. We built the bridge. Some people call it a bridge to nowhere. I've been up and discovered like old parts of the uh, Laurel Line and everything else up there. Uh, but. Uh, if you like to take a walk, but it'd be nice if we seen some money coming in from that power line being on our property. And, uh, okay, I had a thought this week on the trash fee. If we could change it to a DPW fee and possibly have two tiers, people that have their trash hauled out and people that go with the private, like a large landlord or something. But they should be paying something towards the uh, maintenance of roads, uh, snow removal, and so forth. And that's obviously why um, Mayor uh, Doherty set this fee so high, was that if you didn't, then people like in the upper scale houses like Fawnwood, you'd have to start raising their taxes exponentially as compared to the people below. So you'd have a little money coming in here and you'd have to charge a lot of money there. You'd have to raise them so many more percent. And uh, uh, in reality, with a lot of people are getting the fees. I mean, people don't think when they insist that a policeman be walking around in front of their house all night that it's going to cost money, you know? And uh, uh, it's great to see him that way, but then if he has to run five blocks to his car to answer a domestic dispute, it might be too late. You know, it's, so it's just something to think about. Uh, trash fee to DPW fee. And uh, on this Act 76, uh, it's an issue that uh, a lot of prepared foods and so forth will go up to 7%. They're not currently taxed now. Like I see homeless people uh, 
buying at the dollar store. I like the dollar store. I go see what's cheap at the dollar store. Be uh, I get Progresso soup for uh, a buck. It's two dollars and forty-five cents at the grocery mart. So you know, I grab a half a dozen cans, save some money. But now, if you're buying a prepared food, you will be paying 7% on that food, excepting for restaurants, which you probably pay the sales tax anyway. Now, when I was, uh, when I was uh, in the mechanic trade, every week, I generated $120 in sales taxes, minimum. Think about it. You know? Thank you. That's excluding parts. And a lot of the parts were thousands of dollars a week, too. So uh, certain people are getting hit way harder than others on that. Thank you, and have a good night. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council? Good evening, Marie Schumacher, taxpayer. Uh, I guess I'll start with the agenda items, particularly 7A. Would you please tell me how much money is in the budget in what line item for this activity? And also, if there is a ceiling, uh, at which uh, an annual ceiling on what can maybe spent such that we don't exceed the budget without coming back to council? This would be the, the line, and I don't have it in front of me, but it's the line item for professional services under the law department. Well, okay, but how much of that, they have other, other people that they hire, so how much is assigned to this particular task? Well, per, per the I budget, believe it was 150. Per the budget, it's just written in as professional services, and then at that point, it's up to the administration to, to go by need for um, you know, what's needed in, in those services. But they've already made commitments on some of these. That's what I'm saying. How much, how, you start off with say it's 150, which I believe it is. Then if you already made contracts, how much, is, how much does that leave? And then it seems to me there should be a ceiling by year before you approve this such that it doesn't have a humongous overrun such as we did with a, a former attorney that was hired by, uh, by our law department. So I would certainly think that if that's not in there, you should wait another week or more till you get it. Um, next, uh, five, five E. I had requested that we get uh, maybe that the clerk's office, and I think you agreed, Mr. McGough, that that all of the uh, changes that were made in the assessment that the clerk's office could prepare a report after each of these telling us how much our assessment baseline has changed. Um, will that be available next week? I, I don't know what you're asking. The tax the assessor's tax. report for the hearing that was held February 12th. I do know we received those. Yeah. Um, we, ha we have the results. Pardon? We have the results. I'm not sure if it's well, but it's, I'm, it's I'm what asking. You're it's the results for. for the entire county, though. And what I'd ask, and Mr. McGough said he thought was doable uh, several weeks ago, was to pull off the Scranton properties and tell us how much the assessments have gone, either up or down. Uh, mostly down, I would presume. But I think that I would certainly like to know it. I may be the only one, but. Um, and then Boscoff's, uh, Mr. Rogan, you said that was not public information, but um, uh, I, 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 it I makes did, me I did wonder whether you were uh, just trying to put off uh, pending bad news and not wanting to share it with the taxpayers, or I, I still submit that was public, in, that's available, should have been available to the public. That was a, a payment that was due last July and it was wrong of you to block that information as our OECD rep. And I hope that won't happen again, and I hope you will soon have the rest of the, the loans that are in, are not being paid, and what the actions have been taken, and what the status of those are. Um, 
in the caucus tonight, one of the one of the reasons it was presumed that possibly uh, expiration of a KOZ uh, might have something to do. Did KOZs expired in 2010 unless they were extended? Is that not correct? I'm not sure what the date was. I believe KOZs were 2010. Um, now the public hearing that's that DCED is holding in this chamber on the 17th. Uh, I know the public will be allowed to address that, but will there be people here to answer questions that we may have as well? Since will there be people here? Yeah, uh, I'm assuming. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next page. I noticed in the paper too there was a uh, an RFP for uh, insurance, and yes. and that begs uh, several questions that are related to that. Uh, do you have the list of the properties that are covered? I do not have a list. Does, it, does the office have that list? And I, I'm, is, ass, I'm assuming that the the business administrator would have that list. Oh well, in 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 the past, if I may finish on this point, I have a whole lot more, but I guess that's why next week's come. Um, they, for instance, is the ice box on that list? Their contract says that they're supposed to pay their pay the the insurance on that property. Is that included in the list or not? I said I don't have the list, so I don't okay. know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Onvorsky. It's too bad about postcards. Good evening, City Council. I'm Tom Unvarsky. This year, the property owners in the city received the $320 rebate. It doesn't show up on your tax bill, but if it wasn't for the $320 rebate your taxes would have been $320 higher than what's shown on your tax bill. Does anybody know how we're going to get that money from the Gaming Commission? Is it a lump sum? Is it going to be by who pays when that we're going to get that funding? No one knows? Mr. Onvarsky, I'm not sure what you're asking or what, what, what money you're asking about. Is this regarding the homestead exemption? Yes. Oh, okay. You're getting a reduction of $320 on your property tax this year from the Gaming Commission. It doesn't show up on your tax bill. I don't know why they didn't show it on a tax bill, but if it wasn't for that rebate, your tax bill would have been $320 higher. Okay. I, I, I could address this a little bit because I, I just actually went through the process of applying for the homestead exemption i can hear you anyone anyone in the state of pennsylvania can get a small exemption on property taxes on their primary residence this is automatic this is automatic no no it needs to be applied for it's not automatic no no that is a different rebate that you're going to get the, in the sixth month of this year this is a 320 dollars taken off of your taxes, your property tax. Now, I don't know how we're going to collect it, whether we're going to get it all at one time or as people pay their property tax. But this year, there's, it's expected that about 20% of the people won't pay their taxes. However, that money is already allocated 
okay? And we should get that money whether the people pay their taxes or they don't pay their taxes. I think it's something this council should look in on. Also, we've been in receivership for about a year and a half now on the parking garages. That means we're paying a receiver, plus we're also paying a manager $100 an hour. He appeared here a year ago, and he said he had no plan on how to get more revenue into the parking garages. Pretty soon, they will have to come up with a payment, and the city will be responsible for the shortfall. I think it's time that the council sat down with the mayor and got this parking garage straightened out so that we don't have to be paying a part-time manager $100 an hour and perhaps get somebody who could be there full-time for a lot less. It's time that we sat down and got this garage business straightened out. Thank you, Mr. Unvarsky. You're welcome. Anyone else who cares to address council? Fifth order, 5A motions. Mr. Wexler. Thank you, Mr. McGough. Uh, I would also like to express my condolences to the three families that lost members this week. Um, they were all great citizens of the city of Scranton. Uh, I think tonight when we came here, we, we knew that we were going to face some discouraging news about the mall and about job losses. Uh, and, and the city of Scranton, it's, it's never one thing or another, though, it, and, and it, I just uh, enough of people talked about the discouraging news. Um, there are, on the bright side, there are two new businesses opening in the city of Scranton this week. Uh, private money, no government money invested. Uh, one is in uh, the former Whistles. Uh, that's going to have an opening, the Ale Mary. And also we saw where Farley's was, that someone invested private money in opening the city grocery in Delhi. It's kind of a weird thing that we have bad news on one side of town and good news on the other side of town. Um, as, as I look at this, I think the city's role is to keep focused on the problems of the city finances. Um, the best way to help Scranton out is to right the ship here in our own house. I think uh, if we can do that, and outsiders see that the city has come up with a financial plan um, to, to right our problems. I agree with Mr. Ungarski. We have to do something with the, the parking garages. Uh, we have to get our pension in line. And we also have to help the, the taxpayers out. Uh, and I think that's what our role will be uh, as, as city leaders um, to right the financial ship. Uh, thank you, Mr. McGuff. Mr. Rogan? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I would also like to extend my condolences to, to those who we lost through the last week and also some more sad news. I did receive a message from Councilman Loscom um, coming into the meeting that his sister Kathy passed away. So, so we uh, extend those condolences to Councilman Loscom and his family as well. A um, few comments tonight. First, I, I do want to start off on Boscovs. I, I know that's been much of the talk recently um, in, in Boscovs. There are many issues at play here, and hope we. I think everyone on council is hopeful that the mall will come out of um, this situation in a better light. That being said, um, I know many people have asked me if, if the city was going to take action or if anything would be done on the city's end. Um, I would just like to state for the record, I wouldn't support any bailout um, of the mall using taxpayer dollars. Um, I, I don't believe that's the role of government. I know in the past. That has happened with, with other businesses and the mall. Um, I, I don't think that, that that should occur. But hopefully as the process moves forward, the mall can get their finances in order and uh, become what it once was, whether it be in a, a retail capacity or in, or in another capacity. Um, last week, Mr. Quinn brought up an issue. And I was going to talk about it last week, but I, I wanted to think about it a little more. And he brought up the fact that um, Paul McGloin would have been a, a good appointment for parking authority but because of back taxes he withdrew his his nomination and, and I firmly agree with what Mr. Quinn said I do believe that Mr. McGloin would have been a, an excellent addition to the board but 
it, it does would send a bad message to have anyone on a board or authority that owes back taxes. And upon thinking about it more, I think that should be a standard that should be applied to any future appointees, um, to a board or a commission, as well as solicitors of those boards and commissions. And then that further got me thinking whether SRA attorney Carl Greco still has a tax lien against him. Um, I know it was reported in the papers that it was over a million dollars. Um, so I, I think that's something that needs to be looked into. And, and I do think that the policy of not appointing anyone to a board or authority that owes back taxes should be implemented um, by the administration and by city council. Um, next, regarding um, some OECD matters, this Monday we had our first meeting of the Citizens Advisory Council. Um, this panel, um, I sit on it from, from city council and there are also other members of the community um, on the board and the goal of the Citizens Advisory Council is to get input from the public um, on how they would like federal dollars that come in to be spent. Um, we're in the first process, this is our first meeting as I, as I mentioned, we're in the early processes of looking into this, developing a survey that will be placed um, in the newspaper and hopefully on the city's website as well that residents could fill out and send in stating how they would like to see that money spent, whether they would like more money spent in paving or blight removal or whether they would like to see more going to programs like the Boys and Girls Club or um, Dress for Success. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to working together with the group and, and hearing from the public on that. As things progress, we will be having neighborhood meetings um, as, as a board. We'll be going to different meetings. And Tom Preambo, uh, the deputy director of OECD, um, he's the chairperson of the group. So he'll be doing a lot of the present, giving the presentations at neighborhood groups. And if there are any groups out there that um, when it gets to the point where we will be doing presentations that would like to, um, to have us, please um, let us know. Next, regarding Senate Bill 76, I, I'd like to thank my colleagues and, and our guests again for coming in. It was a very informative um, session. And anyone that would like more information or has any questions, um, feel free to contact me. I would be happy to, to get you in touch with any of the three, three panelists who were, the, who were here today. Um, they're all very easy to, to get in touch with and very insightful. And finally, I know there were questions regarding the labor contract, so I did contact um, City Solicitor Jason Shrive um, for some more information. And we talked at length about it, <coughs> and he did provide me a list of the bidders and the costs. Um, Abrahamson, Conaboy, and Abrahamson, which was the firm that was selected, charges $150 per hour and does not charge for paralegals. The other six firms all charge significantly more, and I will go through that list um, right now. Ethan Dennis Esquire um, charges $215 per hour. In addition to that, they charge $110 an hour for paralegals. Um, firm number three, Ballard Spar, $375 an hour for the managing partner, $325 for a partner, $275 an hour for an associate attorney. Elliot Greenleaf, Attorney partner, $195 per hour. Attorney associate, $180 an hour. In addition, $75 an hour for the paralegals. McNeese, Wallace, and I can't read my writing on the third one. Um, they charge $237, um, 332 285 356 um, all the way down to 180 depending on which attorney um, at their firm is doing the work. Each attorney has a different rate at that firm. Reed Smith um, ranges from $325 an hour down to $260 for attorneys um, and $100 an hour additional for paralegal work. And the final firm, Roseanne Jenkins and Greenwald, um, they charge $250 for the partners and $175 for an associate attorney. Um, after reviewing this and talking to Attorney Tribe, I have no question that the firm selected was by far the lowest bidder um, of the bunch and they have done this job in the past I believe under Mayor Connors and th this is um, I also asked if the city always had a, a labor council and it's, it's this isn't anything new um, it's something that that the city has had for decades so I hope that answers some of the questions that uh, I know it answered a lot of the questions that I had um, regarding this vote and I hope it answered yours as well and that is all thank you
Thank you. Um, first, I would just like to pass on my condolences to the Cardamone family and uh, all the families that were mentioned tonight. I knew Mr. Cardamone personally. He was a great guy. Um, and and I, I wish his family the best. And uh, they are in my prayers. Also, to Councilman Lascom and his sister, um, to hear about that is terrible. And I wish their family the best. And uh, they are also in my prayers. Uh, secondly, I just really have one major topic to um, touch on tonight. And that is the growing, what I think anyways, is the growing economic development crisis that we are having downtown. Um, as everyone has read in the paper within the last week, uh, two signature buildings, the Globe Store and Woolworths, are now vacant. And there are rumors that additional businesses are thinking about leaving the city. Um, Diversified and, and VacServe are moving up to Montage Mountain. And along with them are going 300 jobs from downtown Scranton. Along with that is going tax revenue, parking revenue, and the economic impact that those 300 people have on the downtown, whether they eat, uh, shop, and park. So to me, this is a crisis. Um, compounding these problems and the additional stress that's being placed on the city uh, the state is closing the Civil Service Testing Center, the layoff of 65 employees by General Dynamics, and of course what's been discussed tonight, uh, the impending foreclosure of the Steamtown Mall. My qu this begs the question, and, and let me preface this by saying that one of the, I think diversified, is moving into a building on Montage Mountain that the Chamber owns. So this begs the question. Who is fighting for the city of Scranton? That is my question. And I ask that question because while it's certainly possible that there is nothing that the city could have done to keep those businesses here, I don't know what the city did do to try to keep them here. And that is my question. Uh, the public only knows as much as our elected um, and community leaders tell us, and that's that they couldn't do anything. And, and that's if that's the answer, I understand, but no one has explained or communicated what, if anything, was done and what attempts were made to keep these businesses here. And I find that very concerning. So again, it, I ask the question, who is fighting for the city of Scranton? It's responsibility and it's leadership. No one wants to take responsibility, not necessarily responsibility for the vacancies, but responsibility for leadership, for vision, or even the responsibility to publicly come out and say, look, I know that this news might make people nervous and concerned, but here's what I plan to do. Here's how I'm fighting for Scranton in the downtown. But we haven't heard that yet, and that concerns me. And that should come from the administration. So what I'd like to do is request um, information, send a letter to the mayor's office, three, three questions, three basic questions. Number one, what is the mayor's plan? What is the mayor and administration's plan for attracting business into the former Globe Store and Woolworths building, two important buildings downtown? Number two, what if any attempts or counter offers of any sort were made by the mayor and administration to keep diversified and VACServe in the downtown? And number three, what is the mayor and administration doing to ensure that no additional businesses leave the downtown? And I will stress that I have heard rumors that other businesses are considering leaving. So my question is, what is the plan? Do we have a plan? There may very well be one, but I haven't heard anything. The mayor said in the paper that keep the faith. I would be able to keep the faith, and I'm sure other citizens would too, if we knew that there was some sort of vision for the downtown. And maybe there is, but I haven't heard it. And that is why I ask these questions. So I would ask if Mrs. Reed could um, send that letter to the, to the mayor's office. I appreciate that. And um, as I said, I've reached out to Mayor Courtright, Senator Blake, the President of the Chamber, Bob Durkin, and the answers I've gotten are there was nothing we could do. And as I said, that very well may be true, but what did we do? What did we try to do? Who's fighting for the city? As I said, one of the diversified is moving to a, bit, or a, a building that's owned by the Chamber of Commerce. So it begs the question, who is fighting for the city of Scranton? And that is all I have. Thank you, Mr. Gawain. Uh Also to address 
some of these same issues. Um, I know it was in the paper that um, Mr. Amoroso, the consultant hired through the Chamber of Commerce, um, was preparing some preliminary ideas and so on. Um, I think people are waiting. I think you're correct. People are waiting for a plan. People want to know what's going to take place. One of the speakers tonight asked the questions, you know, what, what is it that the city is going to do or what is Mr. Amoroso going to propose? Um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks we hear what that plan is. Um, I, will, I will do everything I can to encourage the public dissemination of that plan, um, be it um, at a caucus or a council meeting. Um, I, I think that we, we all have a right to, to not, not a right to know, but uh, we're all waiting to know what it is that the city is going to do and um, what it is that we can be working toward. Um, as time moves on, we, we be, get more and the problems are exacerbated the longer this goes. We need to start doing something now. And the sooner that this plan is, is made public, then the sooner that we can begin to, to move toward some resolution to some of the problems that we have. Uh, as far as the mall is concerned, um, I, I think it should be noted uh, a, lo a lot of people assume that Mr. Boskoff owns the mall. Um, that, that's not necessarily true. That it is not Mr. Boskoff that is looking to foreclose um, on the mall. Uh, it is uh, whoever owns the mortgage uh, that, that's looking to do this. And everything that, and I, I was at a meeting with Mr. Boskoff, and everything that he said in the newspaper would be an indication that he, he seriously wants to save the mall. Um, and, and to save his interest in the mall, certainly. Um, hopefully that through this process that really is out of our control, the, the foreclosure of the mall is out of our control. But hopefully as this moves forward, um, there is some resolution to that problem. And that maybe we can, if Mr. Boskoff is true to his word, maybe we can be cautiously optimistic that when it's done that the mall will be um, will still be there and perhaps even on better footing than it is currently and then just one last thing that was mentioned I, I know Mr. Quinn has um, spoken for years uh, about the rehabilitation of, pro of properties um, last year when we received uh, we attempted to put additional funding into the real rehabilitation programs through the UDAG or through the uh, CDBG funding and home funding and that. Um, one of the problems that we ran into that I was unaware of is that when you go to rehab a home, you can't do it piecemeal. You can't say that we're, you know, okay, we're going to spend X number of dollars and fix the roof. Um, once someone goes in to rehab it, the entire structure must be brought up to current code. And, and that makes it very difficult for a lot of these, it becomes very expensive and um, very difficult to, to rehabilitate some of the structures that are there, um, that they have fallen into such disrepair that bringing them back to code is really becomes un, somewhat unreasonable as to cost. Um, I agree with Mr. Quinn. I agree with you know, that we, you know, the rehabilitation of properties in the city is, uh, is important, especially as people, as funds, people's incomes, uh, discretionary income becomes less and less, and people are unable to maintain their homes. 
um, we, we really do need to find some way of funding for the homeowner so that they can maintain their homes, uh, reasonably maintain their homes, so that they don't fall into disrepair, so that they don't become condemned properties in vacant lots. Um, and hopefully uh, in the future we can find some, uh, <coughs> excuse me, some creative ways to do that. Uh, I think it is a necessary part of redeveloping our neighborhoods, which uh, is something I think that we're all um, concerned with. And that is all I have for this evening. 5B for introduction, a resolution authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a cooperation agreement between the city of Scranton municipality and the United Neighborhood Centers of Northeastern Pennsylvania organization in order to file an application for financial assistance with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Department of Economic and Community Development, DCED, for Keystone Facade Grant Funding for South Scranton Elm Street Project, Fiscal Year 2013-2014. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. Yes, on the question, I would just like to um, update everyone on this issue. Um, I was part of an email chain with a number of city officials today on this. Um, and the city is strictly acting as a pass-through between DCED and United Neighborhood Centers on this. Um, this, is, this isn't a city project, uh, but we are an intermediary between the state and the recipient. And to add to that, too, that there's no matching funds that are needed from Correct. the city. Um, we are, just, as Mr. Rogan said, we are much just a conduit for the, the grant. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it and so move. 5C for introduction and resolution. Appointment of William Laser, 677 Mary Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18508, as a member of the board of the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority. Mr. Laser will fill the unexpired term of Walter Ranikowski, who passed away July 30th, 2013. Mr. Laser's term will expire on December 31, 2015. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it and so moved. Sixth order, 6A, no business at this time. Seventh order. 7A for consideration by the Committee on Rules for Adoption, Resolution Number 30, 2014, authorizing the Mayor and other appropriate officials of the City of Scranton to enter into a professional services contract with the law firm of Abrahamson, Conaboy, and Abrahamson, PC, for labor and employment legal services for a term of four years. As Chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of Item 7A. Second. Now the question. Roll call, please. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Gone? Yes. Mr. McGough? Yes. I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. Um, prior to adjournment, I, I should have mentioned this before. Um, due to the untimely death of Mr. Cardamone, who was City of Scranton zoning officer, um, the interim or the acting zoning officer for the city um, will be Mr. King, Mr. Don King, who is also the city planner. If there is no further business, uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Meeting adjourned.